Good morning, Ellica City. Oh, you're not ready to worship yet. Good morning, Ellica City. Amen. Happy Sabbath to you. Welcome. We're glad you could join us here in person. We're glad for those joining us online as well. We welcome you. We pray that God blesses you today as you celebrate his holy Sabbath. All right, this morning we have a number of announcements, and I don't like to treat them as announcements. I like to treat them as blessing opportunities. So, blessing opportunity number one, VBS is coming! Amen! Amen! I'm super excited. We're going to do it outdoors again this year, just to make sure we, we keep our kids safe since none of them are able to get the vaccine yet. So we will be meeting outside again here July 13 to 17, 6.30 to 8.45 p.m. So I'm going to ask you just save that date, get that on your calendar, parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles. Just get it on the calendar for all the kids in your life, your neighborhood kids, everyone. Just save that date for us, and uh, the registration link hopefully will be open this week. All right? So this year, though, we're adding another element. This year, we are going to have Teen VBS. Miss Jackie is putting that together for our teenagers, seventh grade, the go, those going into seventh grade and up. They will have their very own VBS with all their own crazy fun activities and Bible lessons specifically for them. So Miss Jackie and the youth team are putting that together. So mark that on your calendars. We want to have the entire family be able to come and have a spiritual time together this summer. All right, blessing opportunity number three. We have a health seminar starting next week. And so we have invited a speaker for this seminar. It's going to start on Thursday night and run th Friday night. And then Saturday morning, we will continue developing those health principles that keep us healthy, that give us a strong, happy lifestyle, to let us live a long time and a happy long time. I always say, oh, I want to live to 100, and then I watch, and I'm like, wait a minute, I don't want to be in my bed for the last 20 years, Lord. I want to be healthy while I'm living to 100. So join us. Put that on your calendar starting June 26, and uh, be prepared to be blessed. All right, blessing number four. I'm, I'm going to lose track real fast. I don't even know if that's the right number. Blessing. If you are looking for Adventist education for your children, Ellicott City Church wants to help you. We want to support you financially. We want to assist you in getting your children into our Adventist schools. You can pick any Adventist school you want, um, 12th grade and under. Um, and so uh, reach out to the, our treasurer, Swami Das John, and get your name on the list. He has a form for you to fill out. We need these forms collected by July 5th because they will be presented to our elders and then to our leadership team meeting in our July meeting. So July 5th is our cutoff date. You need to have that form filled out letting us know that you need that assistance so that we can include you in our worthy student program, our tuition assistance program, I guess is the, team, the correct term. So let us know. Reach out to Swami Das. His email is treasure at ellicottcitychurch.org. All right. Blessing number five, I think. Prayer ministry warriors. Again, we are looking for you to join us in prayer, partnering up with our ministry leaders and in the initiatives for each one of the ministries. We're trying to find one person minimum to pray for each one of them, not just random quietly on your own praying for them. We're looking for you to contact that leader. We'll give you their name and their telephone number. Take a minute, reach out to them, call them, text them, however you get to, the two of you best communicate, and speak with them. Find out what are their needs, what are their spiritual needs, what are their family needs. Take those to heart keep them confidential, and become a prayer warrior for our prayer ministry team leaders. Because if they accepted a job of leadership, you know the devil's not going to sit down quietly and watch. He is going to be on guard on them and their families. So we need prayer warriors for them. Then also speak with them about what are the initiatives? What are you going to do? What is health ministry doing? What is children's ministry doing? How can I pray for the next event so that we cover 
for each one of our activities in prayer because these are activities for the kingdom, not just for a program to check off the list. So we need to cover our activities here in prayer. So if you would be interested in being a prayer warrior for one of our ministries, I need you to reach out to Lois Mead. She is our prayer ministry leader. Her telephone number is there on the screen. It's also in your newsletter. If you still missed it, give us a call. Pastor Masena, Pastor John, or I will be happy to share her number with you. Just reach out and become a prayer warrior for God's kingdom. All right. Next blessing opportunity, next week, we want to celebrate our Sabbath school promotions. Our children grew up on us during this COVID thing. I watched some of my, I've seen a couple of my crater rollers come in, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to send them off. I didn't even get to see them hardly. But it's time. Every year, the last Saturday of June, we have a special promotion for our Sabbath school departments. So this will be for children that are going into pre-K 4th, 2nd grade, 5th grade, 7th grade, ninth grade. And for all of our high school graduates that are going to go into our young adult program, we want to celebrate them next Saturday at 4.30 p.m. We're going to have a drive through celebration with balloons, snacks, etc. So come. Put that on your calendar, parents, grandparents, everyone. Uh, come join us. Even if you don't have a kid, just come celebrate with our kids that they're growing and they're learning in Christ, ready to go to that next spiritual level. All right. The, also, quarterlies. Our adult quarterlies are here. They're available at the Welcome Center. If you haven't picked one up this morning, you can grab one on your way out. They're also uh, available during the week. Just reach out to one of us pastors. Make sure we're, someone's here in the building to open the door for you to get those. Large prints have not arrived yet, so hang tight on those, but you can keep checking with us to see if they've come in. All right. This is a cool project, guys. This is a real blessing opportunity because this is a community outreach opportunity that not only involves us at Ellicott City Church, but it involves a whole group of uh, like 13 other uh, organizations here in Howard County. We are partnering with the public schools, Howard County Public Schools, to do a free clothing giveaway. And what these are, these are clothes that we are getting from overstock from stores. They are brand new clothes that did not sell in the stores. So the stores have donated them to Howard County Public School. Actually, they've donated them to a project called Neediest Kids. And Power County Public Schools connected with them. They have reached out to us because their gymnasiums, they are not legally allowed to open them during the pandemic. They needed a place to distribute. So I signed us up. Oh, come on, guys. I signed us up to bless our community with free clothes. There's women's clothes, um, some men's clothes, children's clothes, all kinds of clothing. We have... 42 boxes, I think somebody said they told me that they got for us that are going to be coming to the church. We need volunteers to help us unpack these boxes, lay them out neatly on tables, get them organized so that on June 27th from 2 to 4 p.m. we can open our doors to the community. They can come and they can go shopping free of charge. Amen? So if you are interested in helping us, please reach out to Terry Wilson. She's our ACS director, and you can use her email, the ACS at ellicottcitychurch.org email. If you don't remember that, that's okay. Contact one of us pastors. We'll get you in touch with Terry. So we, we need all hands on deck to organize and prepare for this activity and to be here to, to greet the people and help them as they shop. All right, this morning we also wanted to uh, let you know that we've created um, – QR codes for our web pages, for our, e our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel. If you're here in the building and you want to share that real quick with someone in an, um, our church service, then you can just step outside out there in the foyer. There is a stand with both QR codes. All you have to do is, is scan that with your smartphone, click share, send it off to your friends, and you can share any activities that you wish in a quick, easy way. All right, we also want to celebrate our 2021 graduates. Amen? Oh, don't get bored on me yet. These are blessings, people. <laughs> All right, we have eighth grade graduates, our middle schoolers. We have high school graduates. We have college graduates. We have doctorate graduates in this room. 
Are you feeling smart yet? You're in great company. So next week, we just want to ha- take a few minutes during our worship service to celebrate our graduates uh, at 11 a.m. We want to make sure we don't miss anyone. So if you know of a graduate, including yourself, don't feel bad. We want to celebrate you. Drop us a quick uh, text or email and let us know so that we don't miss you. We want to celebrate your accompliment- accomplishments this year. All right, next um, um for us is we have another baptism coming July 31st. Mark your calendars. It will be a day of celebration. All right. And if you are considering or, or you have been praying and the Lord Spirit is working on you and you would like to be baptized on that day, please speak with one of us pastors. We would love to join you in your journey with the Lord. So mark it on your calendar July 31st. We ready to worship? Amen. With all these blessing opportunities, it's a mighty God. We serve a wonderful God. Stand, join us as we lift our voices and praises to our King and our God.
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for waking us up this morning and giving us the opportunity to fellowship together and praise you together. Father God, we ask that after today's service, we have a better understanding of who you are and what it means to serve you. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Ellicott City. Hey, yeah, hello. How are you? How are you guys doing today? How was your week? Pretty awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Clap it up. Yeah. You gotta clap. You know, it's a blessing you could all be here today. You know, because you don't know what could have happened this week. You know, God delivered you throughout this week. He avoided you from all those troubles. You know. It's a blessing that you're all here. I'm glad to see so many faces today. All right, so for offering call. <laughs> all right. Um, just a friendly reminder. So there are little bowls for the tithes and offering. And the Take it off. Okay. My, oh, my, you know, I'll just, you know, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this good? Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, there are, um, while the <laughs> video is playing, there are little bowls where you can put your tithes and offerings. Okay. So, the general of an army of Syria was a leper. During one of his conquests against Samaria, the general captured a young girl and gave her to his wife as a maid. The Bible never gives the name of this precious child, but her influence would be great. She spoke of God of Israel, who could heal the husband of her mistress. The wife told her husband of of the hope of a cure. Naaman asked the king of Syria to write a letter to the king of Samaria requesting healing. After several day delays, Naaman arrived at the home of the prophet Elisha. He found a humble home. To make matters worse, Elisha didn't even come out in person to meet the general. He sent his servant out to deliver, to deliver the simple message. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times. 2 Kings 5.10. Angry Naaman headed home, but his servants urged him to follow the command of the prophet. When he did, God healed him of the leprosy. A little girl shared with her mistress. The woman shared with her husband. The general shared with the king of Syria. Naaman came before the prophet of God, and God had changed him. Today, we can do the same. We can give the local budget the funds. The funds are used to help the gospel with others. Your name may never be known, but by sharing, like the little maid, lives will change, as did that of the name of the general. Let's pray. Dear God, um, we'd like to come before you as your children and, ooh, and with our requests, God. And I know that even though we're sinners, God, you will always love us, God. And that you will hear us, our cries out to you, God. And I know at this moment, there are children who are in need. The way that you've blessed us, we can bless others. Not today, maybe not tomorrow, but at some point, God. And I know that you will bless each one of us, God. And continue to work in us today, God. On this wonderful Sabbath day, there are so many wonders that can be made, God. And on that today, you will amplify the blessings that were given here today to others, God. And if there's, even if there's nothing to give, God, I know that you'll always, um, we can always give the word, and that's always such a big, big help. And our name doesn't have to be known, God. And none of the glory belongs to us anyway, so we just thank you for so much. And I pray all these things in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. amen. Putting, putting God first can be difficult. What can we learn from Peter that will help us put God first in our lives today? Peter was one of the oldest disciples Jesus called. He was determined and reliable. On a stormy night, Jesus appeared to the group as a ghost walking on water. Peter was the first to speak out in his desire to be with Jesus, even if it meant jumping out of the boat and walking on water. Putting God first seemed to come easy for Peter until he almost drowned. As Peter walked, he doubted. As he began to be engulfed by the water, he must have felt the shame of public failure. 
he was the one who had asked to come to Jesus. But then, everybody witnessed his failure. In the midst of despair, it's not easy to put God first. But Peter did it. He shouted for help, and Jesus saved him. This story repeats itself. Jesus is arrested and crucified. Peter had promised to be next to Jesus, no matter what. But Jesus warned him of his betrayal. Peter wasn't afraid. He was ready to die for Jesus. This becomes clear when Peter attacks a soldier in Gethsemane. What Jesus did next was perplexing to him. Jesus healed the man and said he didn't need protection. What could that mean? Peter was ready for conflict and Jesus rebuked him. He followed Jesus from a distance and denied knowing him three times that night, just as Jesus predicted. Peter had failed once again. You see, putting God first amidst our failure, confusion, and shame is practically impossible. It's only through God's power that we can accept God's forgiveness and start again. Later, Peter would become an excellent leader as Jesus trusted him again and again. Perhaps you've been unfaithful with returning your tithe and giving your promise in the past. Perhaps you've failed. Putting God first means asking for and accepting God's forgiveness today. It means starting anew to trust in God with your finances. Peter put God first. His example compels us to do the same. As we return our tithe and give our promise, we are challenged to put God first. All right, we want to take a couple of minutes uh, for our church life this morning, and we wanted to remind you about our Guess Who's Coming to Lunch program. Our women's ministries are sponsoring this, and it's a beautiful opportunity for us to spend some time fellowshipping together in small groups, be safer. So we want to make sure you have an opportunity. If you missed the announcement last week, we want to make sure you have that opportunity to sign up. We have two stands out in the foyer there, and this is a fun activity where you don't even know where you're eating lunch next week. Or if you decided to host, you have no idea who's coming to your house next week. Okay, so it's just a fun game, fun opportunity for us to get to know one another and spend some time together with uh, fellow church families. So outside in the foyer there, you'll see there are two stands. One stand, if you would like to be a guest because life is happening and you need to be blessed, feel free. Don't feel bad because we need guests. If we don't have any guests, there's no point in having hosts. So sign up on that guest list there and sign, tell them how many people would be in your family, how many people would be coming. If you are in a situation where you can host, feel free to sign up on the hosting side. I can tell you right now we have more hosts than we have guests, so lean towards the guest side for right now. You can look at the boards and see how they're doing out there. But sign up. Take an opportunity to spend some time together. We really miss our fellowship lunches here at Adventist Fellowship because they make such a difference in our opportunity to spend some time together with, uh, with one another and get to know one another and be a part of each other's lives. So tell, go ahead, sign up on one of the lists out there. And then next Saturday when you show up, our women's ministry is going to hand you a paper telling you where you're going or if you are a host telling you who's coming to your house. So it'll be just be a fun surprise, a nice special Sabbath act activity next week. All right, so take a chance, uh, take a minute after services and sign up for that. So this morning we also have a special weekend upon us. Tomorrow is the official Father's Day. And we want to celebrate the men in our lives. Amen? Amen. We want to celebrate you men because you are the ones who lead us and guide us spiritually in our homes, in the workplaces. It's your special day. So I just want to share this verse with you. It says, the righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. And I like to use that term children loosely because you may not be a father yet, but you may have nieces and nephews that you become that male role model to. You may have children, you may have grandchildren. I want the men in our church family to be celebrated this morning. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm gonna ask my men to stand. 
And it's okay if you're standing because you're an uncle. Go ahead, men. Don't be shy. You make us women stand. We stand for you. Come on, men. Amen. All right. God has blessed each one of you. You are special. He designed you to be who you are, and he has put in your lives the children that he wants you to bless. And so I want you to be proud of that. I want you to know that you are special in God's eyes and that he looks down on you with special favor. He pours out a double portion of his Holy Spirit on you because you are our example for him to our children. We tend to look at God as a male, and so their children are looking at you. Okay, and so I don't, I don't want to put a burden on you, but I want you to know you have a double portion of God's spirit to guide you and lead you. Call out on him. He's there to serve you. All right, children, I need your help. You're going to come and take two bags, one in each hand, and then I want you to share them, the bags, with the gentlemen that are standing. Just do two at a time, and let's share these bags with the gentlemen that are standing. All right. And you can take it to your father, your grandfather, or you can take it to some other man that is standing in our church because they need you to be their fill-in grandparents or grandchildren. <laughs> Sorry, I said that backwards, didn't I? <laughs> all right. We cover all of the men in our church family. All right, I still have a gentleman, uh, Mr. Charles. Thank you, Natalia Eva. All right, I think we got everyone. Children, if you have a father or a grandfather that you know you're going to see in the next day or two, if you would like to take one to them, that is fine too. All right, thank you. All right, at this time we just want to say a special prayer of blessing over our men in our church, so let's bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that you have blessed these men and that you have blessed us by putting them in our lives. And so, Lord, this morning I pray a special blessing over the fathers and the men, the uncles and grandfathers here. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them in a special way. Pour out your spirit on them, Lord. Pour out a double portion because we know that you have called them to a high standard, Lord. And we know that the little ones are looking up to them and they carry a bigger, a big burden, Lord. And so... Um, actually, I shouldn't call it a burden. It's a blessing, isn't it, Lord? Lord, we know that you did this to bless them. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit would be poured out upon them and that they would feel your presence, give them wisdom, and give them guidance in all that they do. In the name of Jesus, I pray these things. Amen. As the praise team comes back, up. We are going to take this time now to refocus on our Savior, asking him to purify our hearts and our minds, to be ready to receive his word and be willing and ready to do his will.
Let's bow our heads together. Loving Father, we thank you today for the wonderful privilege of being in your house, in your presence, and with your people. And now is the time in the service where we pray that you would speak directly to our hearts through your word. We thank you for our fathers. We thank you for the example of godly men, influential men in our lives, who have guided us into of value in this life. And we know that all, all good things come from you. So we thank you. We pray this just now in Jesus' name. Amen. I appreciate uh, Pastor Debbie's words on fathers. And um, I think if there was ever a time where we should really appreciate, or I've really come to appreciate fatherhood, it was in the last year during the pandemic where fathers, I think, were uh, put in a position, many fathers, with younger kids especially, were put in a position to, they were stretched far beyond what they thought they were capable of. When our children ended up having had to do school from home and having to do balance work and doing schooling at home, we would go out, sometimes out to the playground, walk the dog, and I would come across fathers who also working from home, perhaps the wife was working outside of home, but the fathers were there with the kids at the park and the playground. And I had some conversations with some dads uh, of younger kids who were really under that pressure and really p spent an exorbitant amount of time with their children and we're learning to appreciate it. And so I want to really praise God, especially in this last year, for what God has done through many dads. It's a joy to see you today. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture that, i got to be honest with you, was difficult to prepare for. Because uh, this particular word that we're going to look at in this verse uh, was not an easy verse to study, and I'll show you why. So as the uh, sermon summaries are being passed out, this is a good opportunity to tell our children that if you complete your sermon summary today, even with coloring it, uh, Pastor John has a special treat for you after the service, okay? So come and show me your sheet, make sure everything is answered, and I'll give you something. And if you're an adult and you fill out the sermon summary, I'll give you a thumbs up and a smile. Very good. The great Adventist evangelist Mark Finley sh shares a story about an, an extraordinary couple that he met at the general conference session in San Antonio, Texas. They were among a group of delegates that came from China. And this was the first time in the history of the church that we hosted a delegates from China. He spent time with them, and even after the session, they did some traveling to different uh, historic Adventist places, and he got to hear some amazing stories of faith from these brothers and sisters who had traveled from China. And one couple in particular that he names to protect their identity, simply Mr. and Mrs. Wong. Mr. and Mrs. Wong were just an extraordinary couple. Mr. Wong had belonged to the Red Guard Chinese Army. He was an avowed atheist, and he believed that all Christians were ignorant fools. Many years ago, when he had come home from the army on leave, he had discovered that something amazing had happened in his home city. There had been a great spiritual awakening, and the local Seventh-day Adventist church had experienced some one to 2,000 baptisms per year for about three years. Incredible miracle of God. And among those who were baptized were some of his brothers, his parents, and even his wife. When Mr. Wong came home, he was furious. He was enraged that his wife, that even his wife, had become a Seventh-day Adventist. 
He said, and I quote, I could not understand why my own wife would accept such fables, such nonsense. He threatened her in a variety of ways. He would go to the Adventist church and break up their services with his rants and his rage. One day he came with rocks and stones and he threw them through the window, doing everything he could to dissuade his wife from such fables. During that time, Mrs. Wong, along with a few others, were praying earnestly for her husband, and she said, God, do whatever it takes to reach my husband's heart. By the way, if you pray that for your children or your spouse, that's a dangerous prayer. If you pray that and mean it, that's a dangerous prayer. Sometime later, Mrs. Wong developed a serious eye infection. And she had to go to the hospital, and there they had to do uh, surgery on the eye. When she had left, she had a patch on the eye, and the doctor had said to her, now, you cannot strain your other eye, otherwise you will lose your eyesight there. And so this was a very serious infection which threatened her vision altogether. He said, I wouldn't recommend you read or do anything like that. Don't strain your eye. A couple times at home, she would be caught by her husband reading the Bible. And he says, what are you doing, woman? What are you doing with this foolishness? And she said, I needed strength. I needed strength that comes from the Word of God, and so I had to read. And so he would do whatever he can, ridicule, threaten her. And he said, you heard what the doctor said. Do not lose your eyesight over the Word of God. Give me that book, and I will read it to you. <laughs> Amen? He said, what do you want me to read to you? She says, read from the book of Job. Now, if I was introducing somebody to God, I don't know if I would start in the book of Job. But God works in mysterious ways, amen? Amen. And so there Mr. Wong re would read to his wife from the Word of God. And as she was being strengthened, God was doing something in his heart. Over time, he doesn't even admit it, but when she would go in for treatments for her eye, he would be home and he would pull the Bible from the drawer and in the privacy of his own heart and, and in his room, he would be reading the Scriptures. He had read through the book of Job, and he tells later, he told Pastor Mark Finley, I felt like my wife is the modern Job, and I was putting her through all of these things that Job had gone through. Ultimately, there in the hospital, by his wife's side, Mr. Wong finally gave up the resistance and gave his heart to Jesus. One of the things is he had said, Jesus, I, can re I cannot resist you any longer. I am yours. When asked, what was it that ultimately influenced you in your conversion? What really made it for you? Mr. Wong said two incredible things. He said what really was, he says, the faithfulness of his wife, even to never compromise her integrity, really spoke to him. The second thing was the peace that she exhibited in the face of the most severe trials. And he said, many of which I put her through. Let me ask you something. If God can take a hardened atheist, a member of the Red Guard, and lead him to, a, to be a mighty servant of God, because today Mr. Wong serves as one of the lay pastors overseeing churches in China. If God can do that, what can he do for you? And what can he do for me? He said, the peace that she exhibited in the face of the most severe trials, of which many I've put her through. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. If you have your Bibles, would you please take them out? And let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. 
Beloved, we're going to be looking at what Jesus says about being a peacemaker. And if there was ever a time where God's people needed to be agents of peace, that time is now. If there was ever a time in a world that is intense and intensely increasing with chaos and conflict, if there was ever a time where God's children needed to be people who are ambassadors for peace, that time is now. And as we look at what it is to be a peacemaker, at first we have to consider that being a peacemaker really is one who is at peace first. You cannot make peace if you are not living in peace. As a matter of fact, you cannot be someone who makes peace unless you're someone who lives in peace. And so what does Jesus talk about when he's referring to blessed are the peacemakers? Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start from the beginning. If you are visiting with us, we're glad you're here. If you're joining us online, we've been going through a series on the Beatitudes that we decided to call the Beatitudes. In chapter 5, Jesus goes through the teachings on the mount. And he begins with the Beatitudes, and I begin in verse 2. He opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus says in verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, what is that everyone? The children are the sons of God. This is the first of the Beatitudes that has the promise of the status of a relationship. They shall be called children of God. It's no accident that Jesus follows blessed are the pure in heart with blessed are the peacemakers. Because you and I cannot be peacemakers, nor, for that matter, can even be at peace with God unless there is the integrity and purity of heart. Where there is this transparency before God. But I'll tell you why this was difficult Uh, to study and prepare for is because the word that is translated here as peacemakers only appears once in the whole Bible. And it is here. Peacemakers. Plus, besides that, you know, there's some things that Jesus said about peace that wasn't all too positive. Remember, he said, I have not come to bring peace, but what, Jack? But a sword. And then the Bible... uh, say as in some place that they shall call for peace, peace, and there is no peace. And then Paul says in Thessalonians that when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. And so the Bible has some things to say that aren't all that positive about peace. And here Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So I struggled with this because I'm like, Lord, you didn't even come to bring peace, so you say, until I understood what Jesus was indeed teaching. Let me share this quote with you from the book, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. The author says, whoever, by the quiet, unconscious influence of a holy life, shall reveal the love of Christ, whoever, by word or deed, shall lead another to renounce sin, and yield his heart to God is a peacemaker. So, beloved, a peacemaker is not merely someone who goes about putting out fires between people. A peacemaker is someone that through whose life and influence is bringing others into reconciliation with God and with man. A peacemaker is someone who because of their life and their connection with Him, is able to lead and influence others into a reconciled relationship with God. 
So how do we understand a peacemaker? The Bible says a lot about peace. Isaiah 26 and verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. John 14 verse 27, Jesus said that the legacy that he would leave with his disciples was peace. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And then he says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The Bible in Isaiah refers to Jesus as the Prince of Peace. When Jesus appeared to his anxious disciples after his resurrection, he said, Peace be unto you. When the disciples felt that they were in the grips of death out in the storm at sea, Jesus got up and he said to the wind and the waves, what? Peace be still. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, we are promised that the peace of God which passes all, what everyone? Understanding. And so the Bible has a lot to say about peace. But what exactly is a peacemaker? You see, you and I can only be agents of peace if we have received peace with God if we are at peace with Him, if we are reconciled in our relationship with Him. And I'd like to look at the story of one individual. This is a case study, if you would, on somebody through whose life and words, even in his dying moments, was able to bring somebody else into reconciliation with God. Can you think of people in the Bible who exhibited peace in some of the most trying times. It's under the most severe duress. Who comes to mind? Hmm? Stephen? Who else? Jesus, Laurie. You never go wrong with that, Laurie. Who comes to mind as somebody who exhibited incredible amounts of peace under severe trial? I heard Moses. Joseph, sure. I'd like to look at with you at one story today, because that's all we have time for, amen? Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 in the New Testament, the fifth book in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 6, we're going to look at the demonstration of what Jesus spoke of here, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemaker is someone that through whose life and influence leads others into reconciliation with God and with man. Acts chapter 6, we actually referred to this individual last week when we were ordaining our deacons, amen? And this individual was Stephen. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now notice how others saw him in verse 15 of chapter 6. It says, and all that sat, this is talking about the Sanhedrin, the council, all that sat in the Sanhedrin, looking intently on him, saw his face as it had been the face of what, everyone? Of an angel. This is interesting that uh, Stephen stands before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin would be parallel to kind of like the Supreme Court of the United States. But this was the religious Supreme Court, kind of like the Congress, you might say, of Israel. So these were, this was the highest echelon of Israel or uh, Israelite government was the Sanhedrin. Stephen stands before the Sanhedrin filled with the Holy Spirit and he is going to review the sacred history beginning with Abraham and showing how the prophecies given to ancient Israel all were fulfilled in Jesus. But what's interesting about this is that this is a time in history where Israel had rejected the Messiah. Even after they had crucified Jesus, God was still focused on reaching them for the kingdom. The Bible says that he would confirm the covenant with him. And so even after the crucifixion of Jesus, they still had a chance to repent. And Stephen stands and he just outlines this case like a like a good uh, attorney, you might say, 
and he gives the history of Israel with, from Abraham and through the desert in Egypt and pointing with things that happened even in the, in the temple. And all he wanted to do, Stephen wanted to do, was lift the attention of Israel from that which was earthly to that which was heavenly. He says, the laws that you have placed all of your trust in to, to save you have never been able to keep you from idolatry. Everything that you trusted in, the structures, you've made the thing, the thing, and you lost sight of the one to whom they pointed. And Jesus was the fulfillment of all of these things. And notice what it says in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. He gives what is arguably one of the most powerful sermons in the New Testament. And you know that Stephen never really finishes his sermon, Tom. He turns from there and he sees the tumult rising. Kind of like Mr. Wong in his rage and rant and fury. The tumult begins to rise and he knows, Stephen knows, that he's giving his last testimony. And so he turns away from his message and he says, you stiff-necked and, and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you have always resisted the Holy Spirit as your ancestors have, so do you. Notice what verse 54 says. Acts chapter 7, verse 54 says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. And he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up intently to heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Verse 56 says, And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man doing what, everyone? standing on the right hand of God. By the way, note this. God will never see, he will, you will never go through any trial or loss or disappointment in this life where the Son of God is not standing in awareness. You will never go through any trial or difficulty or persecution that the Lord Himself does not stand for His children. But there's another significance of the Lord standing. We'll get to that in a moment. Verse 57 says, Then they cried out with a loud voice, and they covered their ears, the Bible says, and they ran upon him with one accord, dragged him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. And what was his name, everyone? Saul. Now, here's the significant thing. Verse 59 says, And they stoned Stephen, who was calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down as he's being pummeled by rocks. And notice what he says. He cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not lay this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In other words, he breathed his last. This, the loss, the martyrdom of Stephen was a significant loss to the early church. Stephen had been used by God to perform miracles. The Bible says after these deacons had been called that the work of God multiplied and many believers were added to the church. And so the loss of Stephen to the church was sore. But it was through the loss of Stephen and through the influence of Stephen that God was going to raise someone else up. And this individual was standing in approval of the stoning of Stephen. And the Bible tells us, in fact, that the witnesses brought their cloaks, their garments, and laid it at his feet. A, a gesture of the one who was in approval of what was being done. Stephen was stoned, and Saul, this avid hater of this new faith, the Christian faith, was struck by the peace of Stephen. We're told in the book, uh, Sketches from the Life of Paul, that the images of Stephen in the peace, his faithfulness, the glory with which his face radiated at the time of his death, 
that Saul would never lose that image the rest of his life. It was seared in his conscience. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. I'd like to share with you just a, a number of qualities of what a peacemaker is. You see, a peacemaker is much more than somebody who is not in conflict with people or is putting out fires here, putting out a fire there. A peacemaker in the biblical sense, beloved, is someone who is going to take an initiative of reconciliation. And so notice the first quality of a peacemaker. A peacemaker is someone who initiates reconciliation. A peacemaker is not someone who waits. Oh, she offended me. Let her come to me. Now, he said this to me. No, a peacemaker is one who initiates reconciliation. And by the way, husbands and wives, this is good to know. Because God has called us to be peacemakers in the home. What do you say? A peacemaker is one who initiates reconciliation. Second quality of a peacemaker is that it is someone who seeks to, what's that word? Understand the person and not just the problem. You know, us pastors often are, uh, you know, we're always solving dilemmas oftentimes. Not here in Ellicott City, I mean, great church. Great church. But we're often, you know, solving problems. Important. But a peacemaker is somebody who seeks to understand the person. Seeks to know the person and not just understand the problem. That's what a peacemaker is. And to understand the person, you have to be a good listener. And you have to be prayerful. Understanding the person Another quality of a peacemaker is someone who encourages the fearful and the weary. So a peacemaker is an encourager. I think of the story of David. When David was running for his life, he was a fugitive running from King Saul. He was this one who was anointed to be the next king was living in caves because his life was in danger. And the son of King Saul, Jonathan, comes seeking for David. And he gives encouragement to his best friend. And to assure him, listen, my father is not going to touch you. He will never get to lay his hand on you because God has his hand on you. You will be king. You will be safe. And we're told in the book Patriarchs and Prophets that that encouraged the heart of David. In the midst of the trial and the fear, David was encouraged by his friend Jonathan. A peacemaker is someone who encourages the fearful and the weary. We're called to be peacemakers. What do you say? Fourth quality of a peacemaker is that it is one who effectively connects the outsider with God and his people. And by outsider, it is, means that those that are outside those that may be away from God, those that may be far. A peacemaker knows how to effectively connect them with God and with his church. And I think of an individual by the name of Barnabas. Barnabas, in the book of Acts, who came after Saul's conversion, by the way, the church was very reticent about accepting Saul. And with good reason, right? I mean, after all, he was out to kill them. He was the great persecutor of the believers in Christ. But when he was converted, the church was like, uh, how do you know? How do you know? I mean, he's ready to drag us back to Jerusalem. And Barnabas, who heard his testimony, Barnabas was the one who brought Saul, who later became Paul, and connected him to the church. Hey, everybody, brothers and sisters, it's okay. God has changed this man's heart. God has reconciled Saul to himself. You can receive him as a brother. And of course, you know that Saul became the most powerful apostle in the New Testament. And so a peacemaker is someone who effectively connects the outsider 
with God and with his people. We're called to be peacemakers. What do you say? There's a fifth quality that I see in a peacemaker. And that it is someone who seeks the welfare of those who even consider him an enemy. A peacemaker, you cannot really tell someone who is at peace when everything is, uh, you know, just dory. What's the word? What's the expression? Hunky-dory. When everything is like a, a bed of roses. It's, hard, it's tough to tell when somebody's at true peace. But you can identify someone who's at true peace when under times of difficulty or under stress or pressure or loss or difficulty of some sort, they are at peace. And that's how you know the true peacemaker. That's how you know the one who is really at peace, is when everything around them is chaos, but they have the peace of God. Someone who seeks the welfare of those who even consider him an enemy. And in today's society, my friends, there is a lot that is being pushed to call enemy. There is a lot going on today in society that we are that we are being almost forced to have to call or consider enemy. David, when he was running for his life, Saul, King Saul, was the enemy. And Saul was out to kill him. And Saul happened to wander into the cave where David and his men were hiding out. Unbeknownst that David was in there, and his men said, there he is, God has delivered him into your hands. Take that sword and whack him. And David could have done it. And David said, I can't. I cannot lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. And so in order to demonstrate that he had the opportunity, he comes and he, you know, sort of cuts off a piece of Saul's robe, his kingly robes. And later when Saul is on his way, he says, Oh, oh Lord, my king. And David falls to his face in honor and, and deference to the king. He says, King, this is just to show you. You have come to seek harm, to seek me, my harm. But I want to let you know that even though the Lord may have delivered you into my hands, I would not lay my hand on the Lord's anointed. And Saul, for a moment, was moved. David is one who seeks the welfare of those who even consider him an enemy. And my friends, for us to experience this, we need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. This is not a natural thing, you understand. David would have been justified by his countrymen for what he had done, but he knew that he was going to leave everything into God's hands. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, All this from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of, what's that word? Reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. You and I are called today to be peacemakers, to be ambassadors or agents of peace for God. But the only way that we can do that is that we must first be at peace with God. Listen, where there is a setting where there is gossip and envy and backbiting, there is no peace there. And so a peacemaker understands their role because the Bible says that they are called the children of God. Last point. The Bible tells us about this peacemaker. You know that Jesus said, or the Bible says in John chapter 1, that as many as received him, to them he gave power or authority to become the children of God. We are the children of God when we receive him. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 14, it says that as, th as many as those as are walking in the Spirit, they are the children of God. 
And perhaps for some of us, God is calling us to go that extra mile because something needs to be reconciled with somebody. A relationship of some sort needs reconciliation. And God has called us to be the initiators of peace and reconciliation. That through our life and through our influence, somebody is, is reconciled to God and to others. It was a Father's Day that Bill Connor will never forget because it was the day that he would once again get to hear his daughter's heart. I'd like to tell you about uh, a young lady by the name of Abby Connor. Jasmine, can you, Jasmine, can you bring me that bag that's in front, in front of the pew, please? That bag right there, yep. Abby Connor was a 20-year-old girl. Thank you, baby. She had died in a tragic accident while she was in Mexico with some friends. Abby Connor was a loving daughter. She was fun. She was funny. Loved her family. She cared for people. Abby had been a registered organ donor. And at the time of her death, or after her death, her heart had been donated. There was a young man in Baton Rouge, Tennessee, or uh, Louisiana, excuse me, who had, who had suffered heart problems for years. At 21, he had a heart attack. Doctors said that there wasn't much that they could do unless they had a heart, that he would need a heart transplant. And so Abby's heart was donated to this young man who would have died without it. Now, the loss of their 20-year-old daughter was devastating to Bill Connor and his wife. And in order to raise awareness for organ donors, he took a trip on his bicycle. He's a cyclist. And on his bicycle, he took this trip from their home in Wisconsin all the way to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and then back again. And on this trip, he wanted to go to meet the man who had been the recipient of his daughter's heart. Bill Connor arrived at the home of this young man. He, had, he knew that his heart had gone and what the condition was of this young man. And this young man had been grateful for the heart that had been donated, albeit the tragic accident of this young lady. And when Bill Connor arrived in the home, he couldn't help but embrace him. And here was this father who was still grieving the loss of his daughter. And here is this man who is alive because of his daughter. And then Bill Connor did something extraordinary. Because on his trip, he packed a stethoscope. And what he wanted to do, the very first thing, is that he took the stethoscope and he wanted to hear that heartbeat, which was his daughter's, that heart that had belonged to his daughter and he puts the stethoscope to this young man's chest and he hears it thumping. And they have a moment together. This young man who was grateful, complete strangers, complete different walk of life from Bill Connor, but what they shared in common was that heart. The heart of one father's daughter, now the heart of one whose heart, whose life was saved because of it. Beloved, you and I are called to go the extra mile in reconciliation for others, to bring awareness that there is a God who loves them, that there is a peace that can be found only in Jesus Christ, and that that God can change a person's heart and make them anew. God has called you and me today to be peacemakers. 
But before we can be makers of peace, first we need to be those whose hearts are at peace. And I'd like to invite you to do something today. Would you please take out your phone? Yeah, it's okay to take out your phone in church for this. And I'd like, for you, I'd like to invite you to take out your QR scanner, your camera, and if you would just scan this code. Those of you who are at home, if you're not watching on your cell phone, do the same. Take out your phone and scan that code. And as you come to that code, you will see an appeal a couple of questions. These questions have to do with, the first one says, I want to receive the peace of God. God is extending peace to you today. He's extending to you a reconciliation with Him. Perhaps you have been running from Him. Perhaps you have held something back and you have not been in complete and full peace with him. The first one says, I want to be at peace or receive this peace of God. You'll notice that the second question there says, I want to go as an agent of peace for God. If you want to be an ambassador, an agent of peace, invite you to fill that out. Are you getting this? Does it work? Third one says, I want to belong to a small group. I sense that, uh, that I need the encouragement and the fellowship of others. And I want to belong to a small group. If that is you, would you please mark that box? And then the last one says, I want to consider baptism or rebaptism. Perhaps God has been doing something in your life and in your heart and you realize that He's calling you back into a reconciliation with Him. And perhaps you haven't thought much about it, but now you sense that maybe, maybe there's some things that need to be washed away. Some things that I've held on to that need to be washed away. Mark that box. And of course, if you have a prayer request, insert your prayer there. Please provide your name, your number. Only the pastors here will get this. We want to be able to respond to the needs of those that, re that reply. We're going to sing as we close today one of my favorite songs. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, what does it say? Whatever my lot in life, whatever comes to me, whatever my lot, let it be. It is well with my soul. I invite you to stand as we sing that together.
want to extend a special invitation. Uh, if there's somebody here today uh, who needs to recapture a peace with God that has perhaps eluded you, something that wasn't quite reconciled, if there is something that God needs to address in your heart that has kept you from perfect peace, I want to invite you to slip out from wherever you are. Come forward in a safe way, and we just want to have a prayer with you. God only knows what it is in you, but if there is any request, any need that you have that has kept you from experiencing that perfect peace that He has, I want to invite you to come and surrender that to Him. Because God wants to do something in your heart and in your life today. If there is something that needs to be reconciled with Him that we've just conveniently put off, or perhaps something that needs to be reconciled with someone else, and we've brushed it, now is the time. Now is the time. What we want is that peace like a river. Praise God. Wherever you are, we'll invite you to bow your heads. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you today for, for your word. We thank you for the power of Christ to restore, to restore our relationship and to bring us back into perfect peace with you. Today, we want to surrender to you anew. We want to lay before you whatever it is that has kept us from having this peace. And today, Lord, what we pray that you would supplant this uneasiness, any tension, any indifference with the peace that only heaven can give. We thank you. Bless those especially who came forward here. Bless each one of us in a special way. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Just want to welcome everybody here and thank you for coming today. Um, the doors are open. Um, if you have a activity bag, you can put it back in the basket. And just reminded that the offering plates, if you haven't dropped off your offering yet, have a wonderful and beautiful Sabbath day. It is beautiful outside. Go enjoy yourself with your friends and family. Thank you for coming. Bye.